What is going on, warriors, modern day crusaders? You got Hamas on the mind in light of recent events, or maybe some other domestic terror group. What do you do? Best practices, tactics, techniques, and procedures. What is one to do when faced with disgusting kidnapping? Cowardly terrorists like Hamas. How do you deal with that? Well, two to the chest, one to the head is a good start. Now, I do two podcasts, Alpha Male Podcast and Gunfighter Life. There's, they're usually separate. Like I do separate things on those. But there's a lot of cross-pollination here. So I'm probably going to put this out at different times on both podcasts. That's why I started it the way I did. Welcome to the podcast where we talk about all manner of things. Being a warrior, being a modern day crusader, strong, dominant, in control, made in the image of God. And we don't apologize for that. And if this is your first rodeo here, you might be thinking, who is this dude? And why should I care what he has to say? What experience, what training does he have? And I would say, right on, you are good to question that. For that reason, I will put in a bio. Then we'll get into the main topic. I'll roll into a quick abbreviated bio and then into the main topic. First and foremost, I'm a Christian. I don't apologize for that. God is number one in my life. I grew up hunting and fishing in the backwoods of the southeastern United States at a very early age. Some of my earliest memories are with firearms. I joined the Marine Corps at 17, did a couple of combat tours in Iraq. By God's grace, he got me through that safely. After that, I served as a instructor, an urban warfare instructor and a desert warfare instructor for the United States Marine Corps. I also served with the LAPD, both full-time as a sworn police officer and some more specialized assignments, as well as serving in the U.S. Army full-time and part-time National Guard. I've been a FBI firearms instructor, still am an FBI firearms instructor, have been for a lot of years, also NRA certified and some other three-letter government agency certified. I've been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency I won't specify. I've been the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. By God's grace, he got me through all that in one piece, not because I'm better, but because he chose to have grace and mercy on me. I've been a professional hunter and guide. Professionally hunted things like buffalo and elk. Not many people today can say they've done that, but I'm blessed to be able to say that I have. I've hunted everything from white-tailed deer on the east coast to mule deer on the west coast to gray squirrel on the east coast to prairie dog on the west coast and elk and bear and wolf and slain all manner of beasts. A state rifle and pistol champion a few times over in a few different disciplines. Enough about me, guys. Blessed be the Lord my rock who trains my hands for war and fingers for battle. Let's get into today's topic. Let's get into dealing with terrorists. Specifically germane to today, and we might touch on some others, Hamas. Now I'm going to start off and say, read your Bible. Read your Bible. If you want to know about warfare, just warfare, justifiable use of force. And not just what's malum prohibitum, but what's malum in se. What's evil by nature, what's permitted, and what is not permitted. What is murder, what is not murder. You need a firm foundation, man. That foundation for your entire life, in every aspect of it, God at the center, starts here with the Word of God. The ultimate sword for you is the Word of God. You need to be rooted and grounded in that. Before you pick up a gun, you had better pick up your Bible. Number two, I'm going to go right out and say, if you look at the Bible, I would submit that if you are backing Hamas, if you are supporting Hamas, you are wrong. I'm not going to care about some politically correct garbage, some left-wing ideology. You are wrong. That land, if you read your Bible, was given to Israel by God Almighty. Period. Let me give you an analogy. If I feel bad for you and I let you stay in the... I don't actually... We'll just stick with the analogy. 
Let's say I have a house and a piece of property. A nice like live-in garage. And you're not actually part of my household, but I feel bad for you, so I let you stay in the live the living garage on my property. And you decide one day, you know what? I'm an ungrateful little brat and I want to go in and take that house. His house is better than my house. I don't like that he's in that house. And you try and take other parts of that property. Is it wrong for me to then go in and kick you out of the place I was letting you stay on my property? I think you probably get that analogy. That's Israel's property. It's given to them by God. If you're supporting a terrorist group that kidnaps and defiles women, targets innocent civilians like cowards, you are wrong. You make me sick. Now that we've got the right and wrong out of the way, the rooted in the word of God, which I'm sure we'll touch on more in this episode, how do you deal with terror, especially if you're listening to this probably domestic terror here on American soil? What if Hamas sleeper cells are here? And I'd submit they probably are, right? Not to be an alarmist. I'm not. If you listen to the podcast, if you're just tuning in or you're just getting this shared by somebody else, then please feel free to share. I'm not the chicken little podcaster running around. The sky is falling. North Korean paratroopers are about to jump out of the sky with micro EMPs to knock out the power grid. I'm not that dude. But it's probably realistic to think that there are Hamas and radical Islamic terror cells here in America. Right? It would kind of be comical to believe otherwise. We know that there are radical Islamic homegrown terrorists that want to destroy our way of life are, yes, Judeo-Christian nation. It's a Judeo-Christian nation, like it or not. What's that old saying? Love it or leave it. It's a Judeo-Christian nation. It has been. It was founded that way. And if you don't like it, tough. That's the way that it is. And that's the way that it should be, a Judeo-Christian nation. There are and have been in the past, hello, 9-11, radical Islamic terrorists that want to destroy your way of life, kill you, and instate some kind of caliphate. I don't have time to really get into Islam and a caliphate. First and foremost, you ought to be reading your Bible. After that, you probably want to acquaint yourself with Islam. Know the enemy, right? Acquaint yourself with Islam. Understand what they believe. Maybe get an understanding for why they hate us, why they want us gone. As you might imagine, I have some bona fides fighting radical Islam. Uh, Went to war twice for this country. Sadly, they're not the only homegrown domestic terrorists. Another big one that comes to mind is BLM, Black Lives Matter. I find offense with that very slogan. Doesn't really make sense to me. It's like, I'll use another analogy. What if I said, wing nuts matter? Wing nuts matter. No, wing nuts do matter. They do what they're supposed to do. They hold something on a bolt, on a threading. So do hex nuts, so do square nuts. All those different kind of nuts matter equally. They're equally important. Not all BLM, I think, are should be categorized. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Not all BLM should be, you know, treated on the same level as a mosque. But I certainly think there are radical elements of BLM that want to, again, destroy our way of life and our Judeo-Christian nation. So... A couple of things on dealing with them. Maybe, maybe don't be where they are, right? Maybe don't operate in their AO. Make them operate in your AO. Make them come to your AO. Home field advantage, right? Now, if I do some real quick down and dirty inferences on where I think there's likely to be, and you never know, where you're likely to have problems with Hamas and sleeper cells in America. New York, the city. New Jersey, I consider pretty much that entire state a city. Baltimore, Maryland, and any big city in Michigan. If we're looking at Hamas or radical Islamic terrorists, you can probably deduce how I got that in those those places. If I was thinking about, and I don't see the future, right? I don't know, and I don't want to pretend to be a false prophet. I don't see the future, but if I'm guessing places for BLM or radical left-wing terrorists, I would surmise... 
and especially based on past events. Portland, Seattle, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Detroit area, Chicago area, New York area, the giant big city area inside of Texas, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, maybe, maybe like Miami in that kind of area. Notice any trends? Big cities. You maybe think about that. I'm not saying not to live in a big city. I'd be hypocritical to say that. I don't live in a big city now, but there were times in life where I did when I was LAPD, right? As one of the main reasons I left, I actually didn't mind the job too much. It's just living in LA and living in California in general. Only so much of that I could stomach. So when I was the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters, that denoted that I was in a large metropolitan area because that's where active shooters are. I thought it was worthwhile to give up some of my safety to increase the safety of others. You might be in that point in your life, but if not, again, maybe get the home field advantage. Make them come to you instead of operating in their likely area of operation. That's likely where things are going to kick off. Probably, and I don't see the future again, but probably Nebraska, Kansas, the Black Hills of South Dakota, Northern Idaho, Northern Nevada, right? You're probably not going to have issues there because there's almost no people there compared to, especially anywhere east of the Mississippi, right? And north and east of the Bay Area, pretty densely populated outside the very small pockets of Portland and, and Washington. But anyway, quick area study. Number two big thing. Terrorists, I like to look at them like bullies. Bullies in general like to choose weak targets. Look at 9-11. Look at the recent disgusting attacks on Israel. It was one of the big ones. They went to a rave. Now, there's a lot of reasons you probably shouldn't go to a rave. Debauchery, sin, blatant flaunting of sexual sin, drugs. But for this point, right? they targeted them. They're probably not a lot of armed people at a rave easy pickings sadly right they chose an easy target now they did fight some with the idf but they targeted a lot of pockets of what they saw as easy targets easy targets kind of like 9 11 you if you're old enough to remember a pre 9 11 time where up into that point people hijacked planes and took them ransom for money they didn't crash them into buildings full of civilians and I'm not getting into a whole conspiracy rabbit hole, but if you believe that's what happened, what can we glean from that? Easy targets, right? Civilian targets. Mass casualty. How can you glean from that? Be a hard target. Men. Crusader. Warrior. Be a hard target. Be a hard target. Let he who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Home hardening, vehicle hardening, situational awareness. A situational awareness can make you a hard target. Take this to, take it away from terrorism real quick. You got a guy in an alley with a knife looking to rob and or kill somebody for their stuff. Maybe he'll kill somebody, maybe he won't. Is he going to pick on the person with their head down, be with the earbuds in, looking at their phone when they cross by the alley? Or the guy with his head up? Erect posture, paying attention, makes eye contact with him from a distance. Which one of those is more likely to be a victim? Be a hard target. Be a hard target. Part of that being a hard target is being armed to the best of your ability. I just did an episode on Alpha Male Podcast. Big Stick Diplomacy from Teddy. Teddy Roosevelt. The Bull Moose Party Man. And it's commonly attributed to him, but Big Stick Diplomacy. Did a whole episode on that. Walk softly, carry a big stick. You're not out looking to engage with terrorists. But if they are looking to engage with you, you give them a wallop more than they bargained for. Walk softly and carry a big stick. Also, like Jesus said, let he who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Be armed. There's a quote from Jeff Cooper. If that name doesn't ring a bell, we get a lot of 
a lot of modern gun culture from him, including a lot of the firearm safety rules you probably recognize. But Jeff Cooper has a quote about dealing with evil. It's not a biblical quote, so I'm not going to be super worried about getting it exactly right. You can look it up if you want. But it's something like, All an unarmed man can do is flee from evil, but evil is not overcome by fleeing from it. How do you like them apples? The next thing I really want you to think about as a man, as an alpha male, as a gunfighter, as a crusader, you need to think about this, and I'm not telling you what's right or wrong, but you need to decide beforehand so you're not hesitant in the moment. If Hamas sleeper cells or BLM starts getting violent, let's stick with the Hamas one just to give you, paint you a picture. Something goes down here in whatever your area of operation is, much like went down in Israel. You have to... Well, you don't have to. I guess you could curl up and suck your thumb and wait to get shot or abducted or kidnapped. But I would likely submit you have two courses of action other than that. Broad courses of action. You can react to contact in these two ways. I would submit. Pick one. You can decide you're going to react to contact, break contact, retreat to your AO, your family, take care of your family, take care of your kids. That's an option. You can decide not today. You can stand up and fight to preserve other people's lives, to preserve the American way of life. You can decide you can flee and and take care of your family. You can decide to stay there and fight. You can decide to fight and take out, change the behavior of as many radical Islamic terrorists as you can. You should decide this first before all the stress of actually being in the situation. You have you should have a react to contact plan, right? In the absence of a plan, you may hesitate. And hesitation can get you killed. There was a saying, I honestly don't remember who this quote is from, uh, but it's pretty common in military circles. I'm going to put my own spin on this. When contacting the enemy, your best option is a good battle plan, a good course of action. Your second best is a bad plan and course of action. Your worst is hesitation. And no course of action. So have that react to contact worked out. What are you going to do? I've done many episodes on bugging out. If you decide you're breaking contact, you ought to have your basics of bugging out down. Alternate routes, right? Probably not the time to take the freeway. Probably comms are going to go down. In my experience in any mass event like this, comms are probably going to go down if you're talking about a cell phone. Do you and your wife both live in the suburbs and work in the city? Do your kids go to school somewhere? Do you have a link-up point? Do you have a rally point? This is like bug-out basics 101. Emergency planning basics 101. The basics of bugging. Do you have a rally point set up with your wife? Do you have an alternate rally point, a fallback rally point? Do you know where you're linking up? Or are you just going to be lost and not know where your family is for days, weeks? Do you have more than a half a tank of gas? If this kicked off right now, would you be happy with how much gas is in your vehicle? You have spare gas? You have, again, a route to get out. Do you have an alternate route? Okay, you're going to stand and fight. That's your reactive contact. You're going to fight. You're going to change their behavior. You say, I'm here to chew bubblegum and stack terrorists knee-deep in the streets. And I'm all out of bubblegum. You say, hey, Hamas, I'm your Huckleberry. Well, then it's time to get to work. Walk softly and carry a big stick. Here's where the big stick part comes in. I would submit, if you're a man, you live in America, and you can, you ought to be armed. You ought to have your CCW. Now, I I think it may be attributed to Thunder Ranch. I don't know if he came up with it. But another common saying, a handgun is to fight your way to your long gun. I agree with that. Now, if your long gun's at home and you're 30 miles away at your place of work, probably not getting your gun and coming back. 
right? So this denotes a truck gun. I've done, I just did a whole series on truck guns and I didn't do that to plan this out. So you go listen to that, but did a whole thing on truck guns, more firepower than your handgun. And I say this not to brag, but I am a, I do, I've done a, been blessed to do a lot of competition. I've won more shooting competitions, honestly, than I can remember. The bulk of which are handgun. I'm blessed to be a very good handgun shooter. But I'm here to tell you, a handgun is no match for a long gun as far as firepower goes. Can you take out a dude with an AK or two dudes with an AK with a handgun if you're really good? Sure. Yeah. But I'd rather have a long gun. So be able to fight your way to a long gun quickly. Like within sprinting distance. You ought to plan this out. Is it a PDW? Is it a laptop bag gun? Is it a duffel bag gun? Is it a truck gun? If you're going to fight, right, having a sword, having that long gun, having a means of fighting effectively, that's important. Whatever that's going to be. Powerful, shootable, not by some dude on YouTube, not some YouTube, not some gun tuber, Effective when fired by you. Like you're familiar with it. You've trained with it. You know how to fix a malfunction with it. You know that it shoots point of aim, point of impact with the ammo that you have loaded in it. Platform. I do a whole other podcast called Gunfighter Life where I dig into the minutia. You figure that out for yourself. But main criteria is more firepower than a handgun that you're comfortable with, that you train with. Because that's more important than the actual platform, I hate to tell you. The fact that you have a Daniel Defense AR with a bunch of whiz-bang gadgets on it, probably not going to help you out that much if you haven't zeroed it. The platform that you're trained on. The platform that you're familiar with. If you're a big bird and duck hunter and you're really familiar with a Beretta A400 and you want to load it up a buckshot and slugs, that's, that's a lot more firepower than a handgun. You decide for you, but you should have some kind of firepower. You have an ammo supply nearby. You may or may not want some body armor. Sadly, I don't think this is like the sky is falling stuff. This, If you've got body armor, why not keep it in your truck? You may not have time to get it on. You may not have time to get to your long gun. But you may, right, if they land like they did, literally coming out of the sky, you have time to grab a rifle and body armor. If it's close by and you can get it on, yeah, and increase, increase your effectiveness. If not, then it is what it is. But if you've decided that you're going to fight, you should know some basic maneuvers. Basic maneuvers you learn, whether you're Army Infantry, Marine Corps Infantry, of which I'm actually both, or what I should say was both. They never, they always say, you're not an ex-Marine, you're a Marine who's not getting paid anymore, whatever they say, right? But I served in both branches of the armed forces. Both. There's more than that. I served in two branches of the armed forces. Infantry, grunt. You'll get basic react to contact. Near ambush, far ambush. should probably look into that. Near ambush, far ambush. Also, many of us commute. We drive. A gun is not the only weapon. I would submit if deadly force is, au- deadly force is authorized, it's authorized with a vehicle or a gun. I don't care if you drive a Prius. In many situations, that's a much more deadly weapon than any small arm that you're going to have. If there's five Hamas dudes standing in the middle of the road trying to make you stop and you plow into them and then get out with your rifle, that's probably a pretty decent course of action, depending on collateral damage. You get the idea the vehicle can be a weapon too. But you should have some of that react to contact. You should know. You should drill this. You should have some level of of automaticity. He's actually getting out and training. Not just wearing a with an American flag and a MAGA hat and drinking a black rifle coffee. There's nothing wrong with those things, but that doesn't make you a warrior. Get out and train. Have a react. Have a near ambush drill. Have a far ambush drill. What about some other sneaky tactics these guys like to employ? Terrorist threats. A real common one for a long time has been Molotov cocktails. Do you know what to do in the event of Molotov cocktails? Do you have a way to deal with that? Do you have a fire extinguisher in your car? Another real common one that's real cheap and really effective, mortars. Anybody that fought in the GWAT, the Global War on Terror, is probably familiar with mortars. Mortars usually have a pretty high arch. How do you take cover from mortars? If you've never, never had the distinct displeasure of having 
rounds, AK rounds or other rounds, fly by you, whiz past your head, maybe get acquainted with that sound. Maybe listen to what that sounds like. Listen to a recording. Um, Decent training that I've had, even as a civilian, they would take you and sit you behind a berm and shoot over your head. If you've never had incoming rounds, even if it's just a recording, you should probably know what that sounds like and use that if you're out doing your shooting drills of recording. I'm talking about don't shoot at your buddy. A recording of rounds going by. Maybe that's your buzzer that sets you free and lets you engage the target. But incoming rounds, what does that sound like? How do you react to incoming rounds? Shoot, move, communicate. Have that drilled in. What does a mortar sound like? What does it sound like when it goes off? What does it sound like when it's inbound? What do you do? You're probably not shooting the mortar out of the air, right? So you got to have a different react to contact drill for that. Fire and maneuver. Shoot and communicate. As we say in the Marines, locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver. Or repel an enemy assault by fire and close combat. The time to figure this out is not when you see the Hamas Air Force, right? Gliders with dune buggies on them falling out of the sky. That's not the time to figure out what you're going to do the time to let that automaticity kick in that it's not really a thing but what we call muscle memory kick in and you're already doing it before you even think about it and that will count way more than whether you have a daniel defense ar or smith and wesson mmpar your 308 main battle rifle man your m14 those other things are going to count more than the differences between those platforms and i i'm a tactical dude right i like tactical stuff i have a whole podcast gunfighter life but i'm telling you that other stuff is more important Also something you might want to be familiar with, with stuff like this. Medical, emergency medical. Now I was blessed to get TCCC training, tactical combat casualty care. You should have some kind of emergency medical training. At the very least, learn how to put on a tourniquet. I would suggest more than that, but there was a lot, in my opinion, of unnecessary death and destruction in the GWAT. There was some good to come out of that out of all that sadness and we came a long way as far as like combat medicine combat casualty care and you should probably know how to throw on a tourniquet sadly i've had to use those skills in real life again the time to figure out how to use a tourniquet is not when somebody is bleeding to death you should be familiar with how to put on a tourniquet it should be automaticity it should be oh there's an arterial blood gushing out of this dude's femoral artery or my femoral artery Good thing my tourniquet's already prepped and somewhere I can reach it with both hands. A few seconds you've got it on instead of looking at it in the wrapper and being like, oh, I bought this on Amazon. What do I do with it? Right? That's not the time. Maybe next time you're out at the range training, you actually, in a safe manner, incorporate some tourniquet or emergency medical drills into your shooting, your training, even a dry fire training. Maybe set, you know how you got those alarms, set one on your phone for a day later in the week that you're going to forget about it. And when the alarm goes off, grab your tourniquet, which I'm hoping you're carrying for EDC, and throw it on. Anyway, emergency medical, important. And not just for this, not just for Hamas, right? Car accidents are probably more likely to get you hurt or somebody that you know hurt than Hamas. So emergency medical, that's also important. Post-combat checks, right? Are you injured? Because you may not feel it at the time jacked up on adrenaline. Are you injured? Do you need medical attention? Does anybody around you need medical attention? How is your ammo situation? Are you green? Are you yellow? Are you red? What intel can you gather from your situation? Men, I really hope that this never comes to fruition in our lifetime here on American soil. As somebody that has been to war... It's a horrible, disgusting thing. When I was a young, naive man, I thought that going to war would be glorious. War is a nasty business. War is horrible. I've seen horrible, horrible things that I have no desire to ever see here on American soil. But that might not be up to you and me. Are you watching? Are you ready? All right. With that, I usually close with a tactical tip of the day and a tactical verse of the day. Tactical tip of the day. If you're into this kind of tactical training, you're probably familiar with shooting steel targets. Which means you're probably familiar with spray painting steel targets. Depending on the wind, those little flakes of paint can travel quite a distance in the wind and stick to stuff. Now, if it's just your rifle or whatever, not a big deal. But if it's optics, if it's glass, your pistol optic, your rifle optic, 
probably don't want a little flecks of paint sticking to that and then having to worry about getting it off and maybe you're a little too zealous and you scratch up your glass just real quick when you're going up to spray paint the target put your hand over your optic if it's a bigger optic put your forearm on the back side of the optic and your hand on the front side of the optic when you're spray painting those targets <laughs> could save you a lot of frustration later simple tactical tip but again maybe really really useful an ounce of prevention better than a pound of cure that's your tactical tip of the day your tactical verse of the day how about from the book of joshua no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as i was with moses so i will be with you i will not leave you nor forsake you be strong and of good courage for to this people you shall divide an inheritance in the land which i swore to their fathers to give them only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which moses my servant commanded you do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it for then I will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage do not be afraid or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go I don't think that needs a lot of commentary from me men if you ever need to go Joshua and fight men in God's country. It's a good verse. Thanks for listening and have a blessed day.